wonderful to be back. Really is. We missed you. And it's really nice preaching to people who are out there and not just empty chairs. Although I, I did have the folks at the back were uh, kind of like a captive audience uh, to my preaching. So there was no doubt about it. I was speaking to them. Oh, yeah. Uh, but it's so nice to be back in the house of the Lord, worshiping with everybody as, and to see you and to just be connecting with you again. And we just encourage you to continue to connect in all the areas uh, here at Kingsville Community Church. And for those who are watching us out in the community on their television or if they're streaming, we are open. We're open at 9 a.m. Uh, on Sunday mornings for a gathering at 1030. And we'd love to have you a part of what we're doing here as well, too. There are a number of different ways to connect with us and to become a part of something. In fact, I was talking to a, a person this week and they're going to connect with uh, us online during one of our connect groups. And many people start there. They start in a connect group. So it's exciting. It's exciting what God is doing, just exciting. And, you know, God is doing bigger things than we could ever imagine. Uh, if you can uh, just see the, the, the connections that we have and how our church has grown and our influence has grown throughout this pandemic and the many, many people that we are reaching and touching that we wouldn't normally be uh, and, and people that have come and, and just they're new. And some of them we haven't really seen yet in service, but uh, they connect with us. And so if you're one of those people, we are so glad to have you connecting with us. And for those of you here today, it's, again, it's so glad. It's so wonderful to see you. I want to speak to you this morning about preserving and renewal, preserving to experience renewal. We've updated a lot of our equipment. Uh, our equipment was kind of borrowed and, and it was stuff people gave away. And we, we kind of hobbled everything together and we got online many years ago. And, you know, our line, online people and our sound people, they are great. I mean, they do miracles and, and they've been just uh, patching stuff together. And at one time, I think it was about two years ago, they were going to this uh, seminar on online uh, church in a big city, all these churches were getting together. And I said to them, I said, you know, you guys are the ones that need to be teaching that seminar. And because we have so many people online, that was back before the pandemic because of the job that they were doing. And uh, now, you know, we have, we have, that has just grown and grown and grown and as well pe people to connect with our church. But so anyway, we have updated some of our equipment and one of the pieces of equipment that we were looking at updating, we, we purchased this piece of equipment and it was supposed to uh, sync with the cameras and all of the other equipment that we had. And when we got it, we opened the box. Uh, it wasn't the piece that they said that it was. It was a different model. It wasn't going to sync or connect with anything uh, that we had. It was different serial numbers, different model. Uh, wouldn't work. Couldn't, couldn't get it to work to do anything. And we realized that what we had received was not what was being advertised. Okay? You ever had that happen to you? This is what it was advertised, but... But this is what we, we got. It was not as advertised. And so we're, we're trying to send that back and, and resolve that issue. But when, I, when I, I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about this morning, many Christians today are facing that same, that same disconnect, that, that same problem that, that there are issues and there are things in uh, our lives that maybe this, this pandemic and this crisis have kind of revealed to us where we found that not all things were as advertised, that there are these disconnects, or I, I call them crisis. And a crisis is simply something, it's two things really, it's something that has a whole pile of danger and also some opportunity. And I, I think in the Chinese characters kind of bring this out in, 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 a Chinese, in the Chinese character when they want to use the word crisis, the character they use there, it, it signifies danger, lots of danger, but also within that danger, opportunity. And the pandemic is a crisis. It really is. There's all kinds of danger in the pandemic, right? And, and yet at the same time, 
uh, we've been able to really grab onto the opportunities that are there and seen our influence in the work of God grow. And so in our culture, there's this crisis in, in, in our, our culture, our belief systems, that many things are not as advertised. And unfortunately, and when it comes to culture and faith symptoms and things like that, systems, we just can't send it back. You know what I'm saying? We just can't put it in a nice little box and send it back to the source. Followers of Jesus are facing this this crisis of not as advertised. And I, I just want to highlight just for just a moment on at least three fronts. And one of those fronts is in the community. There's, there needs to be a perseverance because there's a crisis in community. In other words, there's lots of danger, but there's some opportunity here as well. See, here's how I see it. Christians advertise that they're compassionate and interested in working at peace with other groups, with other churches, with other believers, and even with authorities in their community for the common good. And, and we, we do that. We say we're a church here and we're here to work with the community, to bless the community, meet needs in the community. However, oftentimes the current events and issues have divided Christians. They split churches. They've even caused followers of Jesus to stop communicating with each other in this cancel culture. Now, cancel culture has been around for a long time. I don't know, maybe we got it from that television show, The Survivor, you know, where people would get together, vote, and throw you off the island. And, and we kind of do we kind of do that now with everything. If we don't like what you say, we just throw you off the island. We just banish you. We just cancel you. We don't listen to you. If you don't agree with everything we say and even the words that we use, we just we just say, no, that's it. We cancel you. You're done. You're off the island. I went many years ago. I don't know. Maybe I'm kind of an old guy. I went to visit one of my nieces, and, and I'd say something to her, and she'd go, banished, banished. She just couldn't believe somebody like me was in her family. You know what I say? She loves me now. But, but back then, when she was just a young teenage girl, she thought, oh, my uncle, banished. And, and, but we're like that with one another. It's caused this, this crisis. Now, I realize that there are many complex and frustrating issues, and I'm not referring to a specific action or the pros and cons of different points of view. They are out there. I hold strong views. You hold strong views. Everybody holds strong views. And Christians from the time of Jesus have held strong views. That's not my point. My point is this. This crisis is how we handle them differently in a very worldly way of cancel culture. And I see it all the time. I see it all the time. I hear it all the time and it's worldly and it's, it's wrong and it's a crisis and there's a lot of danger in that, but there's also opportunity. There really is. M many, many years ago, uh, I had uh, some folks on my worship team. We had a, a new person come on our worship team and they had come from a different church. They had different ways of doing things. And of course their way was right. And, 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 and we didn't do it their way. And, 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 and our way was right. And there was this, you know, it, there's always this kind of, how do we fit together when you bring a new person on a team? And there was this, this, this friction, this tension. Uh, they were getting on each other's nerves. And, and I heard that there was going to be a meeting at Tim Hortons. And, and pastors hate secret meetings at Tim Hortons when it involves the worship team and a conflict in the ministry. You're like, oh, no, my piano player's going to be gone. You know? you're, you're like, what am I going to do? And I was afraid. And I, I called one of the guys on our, our worship uh, team. And I said, I hear you guys are meeting. Do you want me there? And he said, no. Ah. But I'm the pastor. No, no, pastor, we don't want you there. We're going to work it out. I said, well, what do you think is going to happen? He says, well, we're going to be Christians, and they're going to be Christians, and we're going to work it out. And, and, and so I was, <laughs> I was praying, Lord, <laughs> uh, you know, help, help these guys. Here's what happened 25 years ago. These guys got together. They had a talk. They prayed together, and they got along and became friends. And I feel, I feel, I fear, I fear. That we don't see that kind of character today, do we? We see a character as, well, if you don't agree with me, I'm not talking to you anymore. I'm not hanging out with you anymore. I, I'm just going to cancel you. I'm going to cut you off. And there, there's, a great, there's a great opportunity here, folks. That's the crisis. The great opportunity is this. And we put it right above our door at the back. You put love in action. That you start being a different kind of Christian. You start to reach down really deep and realize that you can hold different points of view from people. And you don't have to cancel them, but you do have to put love into action. So, so that's, a, that's a crisis of Christian community. 
We're, 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 we're many times, we're not as advertised. We're not those loving people. And there's an opportunity to be that loving Christian community. There's a crisis of leadership. Christians have followed, respected, and even idolized a number of high-profile leaders. These leaders were advertised as being models of knowledge, wisdom, and examples for people to follow who know Jesus. Yet we've witnessed many of these leaders fall into the trap of money, sex, and power. We talked about that last week. Their indiscretions have left many believers scandalized and struggling when their leaders were not as advertised. And that's not just not in the high profile. The high profile have an bigger influence, but that can be just in your local church. You know, wherever one of us messes up, it affects a lot of other people. It affects a lot of other people. It affects our family. It affects our friends. It affects our church. It affects our, uh, 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 the, the people that are looking to us as, as being, uh, being men and women of God. And there is a crisis of leadership today in the church. There really is a crisis of leadership, even in our homes. There's a crisis of leadership in our homes and definitely out in the world and community. Again, this is a great danger in churches, but it's also an opportunity for you and for me to rise up and to use the gifts and the skills that God has given us to be leaders and to make a difference for Christ. Then the other crisis I see is a crisis of spirituality. Many people who are seeking authentic spirituality do not look to Christianity as a place where it can be found. They do not look for Christianity for a place where it can be found. And it's because maybe they've had an experience in church where just, you know, there was nothing there. There was nothing there. It could be that what they get is what they see on TV or or they read in the newspaper that seems to highlight when somebody kind of goes off on their own and they're, they've got some kind of extreme view or, or they, they've prophesied and made false predictions about the outcome of things and, and, or they, they've got this, they're kind of going this way. The majority of the church and the Bible is going this way and they're way over here. But many believers in church... And I have to ask myself this question. Do we model a vibrant spirituality in our personal lives? Are we ourselves guilty of advertising that we have the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit living in our lives? But our life really is lived disconnected and disinterested in a passionate spirituality. And folks, when we face these crises, it's natural to give up. It's natural to say, why bother? It's natural to just throw our hands up in the air and say, I, I, I don't need any of that. It's, that's a, a natural thing. That's what the devil would have us to do, to run away or to give up. But what does Jesus want to do? And when the church and when people are in crisis, that is the time. And when we are most ready, we are most ripe, we are most open, and we are most able to receive and experience renewal. Crisis always, always leads to renewal in the church and in what God is doing today. And I want to be a part of that. And I I hope you do too. Are we on the same page? I hope so. I really hope so. And so my sermon in the sentence is this. We need to have perseverance to experience revival. So I want to take the rest of this time to speak to you about what I think is really important for us today and how we get to that place where we can experience renewal, where we can experience a fresh move and outpouring of the Holy Spirit and how we need to guard ourselves, how we need to guard ourselves against the excesses and the things that are not of God out there against the crisis, how we turn crisis into opportunity. And here's the first thing is we need to persevere in discernment. See, all of these problems that you see today, every problem you see today existed in the early church. Every single one of them. The early church had to deal with false prophets, false teachers, false motives, leaders who fell away, people who proclaimed to be Christians and were not really serving God. The early church had the same problem. John writes to the early church, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, Dear friends... Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And when he's talking about testing the spirits, he's talking about the the attitude and the message and, 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 and just the mannerment in which things are being spoken today. And we have to test those things and say, is this from God or, or is this not from God? You see, the New Testament Christians did not stop prophesying 
Even, because, even though there were false prophets, it didn't stop them from doing and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through their lives. They didn't stop teaching, even though there were false teachers out there. They didn't stop teaching. They, they didn't stop speaking the truth because some professing believers were not as advertised, were not real. No. But what they did do was they got into the scriptures and they allowed the scriptures to lead them and to inform them and to sensitize them to what was really true and what was error. Second Timothy 3.16 says this, all scripture is God breathed. God breathes into the scriptures just in the same way in Genesis where God breathed into, into Adam and, and made him a living soul. It's the same idea. God breathed into the scriptures. They're the breath of God. And they are useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And, and what that simply means is as we get into the scriptures, it, it accomplishes these four things. It, it teaches us what's true. It, it teaches us that these are the things that are true. This is truth. This is right. This is what's right. But it also makes us realize when something is wrong. And sometimes, you know, if you've been reading the scriptures and, and you hear something and you just can't put your finger on it, what is it that's wrong? But there's something in te telling you on the inside, you know what, this just doesn't line up. You just get that feeling that there's something wrong. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I know this is not right. And what, what is it? What do we call that? Well, well that's called discernment. That's called discernment. And you know what? Not only do we get that sometimes from what people say, but we can get it from, from just people. Like we, we meet somebody and we feel something inside. And it's like, that, there's something not right. You get kind of like the, the heebie-jeebies. Do you use that word anymore? Heebie-jeebies? Yeah, some of the, the older folks are going, yap, and the younger people are like, the what? Okay, you know, there's a generation. There's just kind of the willies. Like, I don't know what you younger adults use for that, but you know when something isn't right about somebody and you're like, I, I don't know about that person. And you can't put your finger. That's called discernment. And what I do when that happens to me is I, I usually just kind of, I don't judge them, but I give them time to see whether what I'm discerning is proper and from the Lord or not. That's, that's what we do. And, and so that, where does that come from? The scriptures. Well, guess what? The, the scriptures correct us. It corrects me when I'm wrong. Anybody perfect here? No. Okay. So we all need to be corrected. Isn't that right? We all need to be corrected when, when we are wrong. And so the scriptures correct us when we're wrong. And then they teach us what is right. Those are the four things the scripture does. Teaches us what's true. Makes us realize when something is wrong. Corrects us when we are wrong. And teaches us to do what is right. And so, so the application of whole, this whole discernment and how you get it is you need to spend time in the word of God. You need to have a devotional time. And you need to spend time studying the word of God. And so get yourself in a connect group. I mean, coming to church on Sunday is great. But also you want to be in a connect group. And listen, there's the, the, the quick way of getting yourself deceived is to isolate yourself from somebody else, from everybody else. Don't be a part of a group. Don't be a part of a church. Just, just, just isolate yourself in your own thoughts and your own ideas and then state your claim that I'm right and everybody's wrong and you will be deceived. I will guarantee you that you've just invited the, de the devil to come into your life and, to, and to, to, to deceive you. But when you get together with other people in a connect group and in a church and you're fellowshipping with one another, and you're learning together and you're studying together, a whole door opens of discernment and understanding. So get yourself involved. That We have coming up, we have this thing, it's called a set free retreat. We've done a couple of these. We did one in Kitchener. We did one here in Kingsville. And we have one coming up March the 26th and 27th. And how many have been to a set free retreat? Just let me see your hands. Okay, we've got a number of people at the back here. If you want to know about it, talk to one of those people that have been to a set free retreat because it will just deepen your walk with God. And it deals with some of this stuff in our lives. And, and it'll energize you and uh, really give you a great a great curve of Christian growth. We are able to do one of those. It'll be a virtual retreat and we are connecting with a number of churches in Atlantic Canada to do this retreat. So we'll all be together virtually doing the set free retreat. And all we need you to do is register for it because we need to know you're coming. We need to have your name and your email so we can send you the information and the course materials. Okay. And you can do that through our website. 
The second area where we need to persevere is in spiritual passion. See, when we get off track like we are today, we need to seek renewal for our lives. We need to return to the ancient paths to a holistic, that's mind, body, and spirit, a whole holistic re, uh, pursuit of loving and serving God. Habakkuk was a, was, a, was a prophet. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 2. In the Old Testament, he, he had all kinds of issues and he was upset with God and he was arguing with God and he was frustrated with God. He was like many people today where there were so many issues and he didn't understand them. And, and, and he got to on his knees and he's arguing with God and he comes to this conclusion, Lord, I need a renewal. I need a renewal. And so he writes this in chapter 3, verse 2. Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Repeat them or renew them in our day, in our time. Make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. See, folks, the power of the Holy Spirit does not reside in church buildings. Can I have an amen? It just doesn't. The power of the Holy Spirit does not reside in in programs. Can I have an amen? Just doesn't. Come on, folks. It doesn't. The Holy Spirit does not reside in your belief system or your theology. Can I hear an amen? The Holy Spirit and his power resides in people. It resides in you. It resides in me. And the Holy Spirit will work in, work through any, any vessel that is open to his, to encountering him in a refreshed and renewed way, in an authentic way. So seek the Holy Spirit to fill your life. Say, I want to be passionate. I want to be filled. I want to walk in your presence and in your power. I want you to fill me. See, expect God, when you ask Jesus to fill you with his spirit, expect him to fill you. Expect him to empower you. Expect him to work through you. One of the things, the big things that we've got to get, get behind us is this idea that, that the Holy Spirit only works through the church or only works through the pastor. No, no, no. He works in and through everybody. I like the story of Philip in Acts chapter 8. Philip was this guy who was chosen to set up tables and hand out food. Now that doesn't sound very glamorous, right? If we say in the church, hey, we got a great ministry for you. We need you, we need you to set up some tables and hand out food. Everybody's like, oh, well, I wonder who's going to do that. Anyway, Philip was one of the guys who was chosen to do this. And yet he was an apostle. He was not an apostle. He was not a pastor. He was not a preacher. He was not a teacher. He was not. He, he, if, the, if you said, Philip, what do you do around here? He'd say, well, I, I set up tables and, and I hand out food. You think, oh, wow. <laughs> Great guy. And yet God worked mightily through an ordinary person like you and like me. God worked through him and through his life in Samaria, in another city called Samaria, with gifts of discernment, miracles, healing, and evangelists. That's what God used him. And God can use you in the same way. When we get passionate about being filled with his spirit, Romans chapter 12, verse 11 says, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. And so what we need to do is we need to, we need to connect with God. We need to pray, but not just pray, listen in prayer. This Wednesday night, we get together for our, our monthly prayer gathering. We pray, we worship, and we pray. It's what we call prayer, prayer and praise. And we take an hour and we just listen. We pray, we worship, we listen for the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Come expecting that the Holy Spirit will fill you, that the Holy Spirit will say something to you, and the Holy Spirit will give you something that you can share with somebody else. That's what we get together. That's what we, that's what we expect. And when we expect those things, guess what? God does those things. And then the, the last thing. So we call it perse persevering and persevering in, in, in these three areas. The last of those three areas is simply this. Persevering in the Great Commission. In the Great Commission. The one thing Christians must do is the thing that is so easily ignored. Every Christian... Every Christian, not just a pastor, but every Christian has one 
primary purpose that God has given to them. Just one. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19. We call that the Great Commission. And that is the one thing. And he didn't give that to a church. He didn't give that to a denomination. He didn't give that to an organization. He did not give that to a program. He gave that to the disciples. You're my disciples. This is what I want you to do. And folks, we need to begin to pour, pour our energy, our passion, our time, our resources into the Great Commission. It'll breathe fresh life, the anointing of the Spirit on your souls. It'll transform your lives. It'll energize your church. It'll change your community. We're, we're asking, we we'll ask our congregation to, to do this in our open door classes. We, we, we talk to them about some things to how you measure your walk with God. And one of them is four to five spiritual conversations a year with people who are, are not Christians. Four to five, one every three months with a family member who's not serving the Lord, a friend who's not serving the Lord, somebody at your work, somebody at the, at the donut shop or at the, at the, the corner store or, or at the grocery store. Four to five conversations a year with non-Christians. Get involved in the community. In the, you know, we have a community center here and it's, it's not running right now, but it will be up and running as we, as we move through the different, uh, the different levels. But whoa, what an opportunity to meet the needs in the community, but also to share. Many of the people that connect with our community center, you know what happens? They start to connect with the things of God. It just happens. It just happens. It just happens. And then we'll hear from our missionaries next week and the week after, Jeff and Renata and Darren and Patty. I mean, they're, they're ministering under the same restrictions we have here. They have them, one in South America, one in Africa. It's the same everywhere, everywhere. And yet God is doing a great work through both of those missionary families. We want you to know about it. So this morning, are you willing or do you want to per persevere and experience renewal? That's what God has for you in our church. We need to have discernment, folks, and perseverance and discernment. And that is getting in, into the Word of God, studying the Word, reading the Word, being in a, in a connect group. S sign up for the Set Free Retreat. Sign up for it. Be a part of that. Let God work in your life. We need to preserve it in spiritual passion. In spiritual passion. Come on out on Wednesday night and pray with us for an hour. Worship and pray with us for an hour. But, but to, to preserve in that and, 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 and to really seek the Lord to fill you with his spirit and, and expect that God's going to speak through you and use you. Because that's what God does. And to be a part of the Great Commission. To put our passion in our heart to reaching people with new life for Jesus Christ. That's what we're here for. That's our primary purpose. And maybe this morning you need to know him. Or, or if you're here this morning, maybe you need to recommit your life to him. I, I think many people that are here this morning are really doing these things. Many of you really are. But maybe there's one area in your life where you'd say, you know what, there's a crisis, Pastor. I, you know, you've talked about three, but I, I have another one going on right now that I need God to deal with. And, and maybe identify that and begin to pray about it and, and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you about what he wants you to do about that crisis that you have. Uh, maybe this morning there's one thing that you could change, that you could change, that would bring spiritual passion, a greater depth of knowing him, uh, bringing you closer to God. And maybe you need to accept him or recommit your life to him. So let's, let's close this time together and let's just ask God to minister by his power. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are you're in control and Lord, with crisis, with crisis, yes, there's danger and we know that. But Lord, there's, opera, there's also opportunity. Help us to find the opportunity. Lord, keep us discerning what is your will and what is you. Keep us, Lord, in that place, oh God, where we are, we are serving you in wisdom and walking in discernment, Lord. And, and Lord, then help us, O oh God, to, to persevere in spiritual passion, 
to really walk with you and serve you in that area, Lord, of our lives, to keep it, to keep our spiritual passion hot, our zeal on fire. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us to make room in our lives for the Holy Spirit to work and to lead us and to speak to us and to give us wisdom and to guide us. And even, Lord, to help us to have speak into other people's lives encouragement and comfort. Lord, help us to be committed to the Great Commission. There's people in our lives that need Jesus. Lord, help us to have an opportunity to speak to them about our faith. Now, Father, we just pray for those who maybe need Jesus and they're, they're listening to this broadcast. And Lord, I just pray that as they listen, that the Holy Spirit would speak to them and convict their hearts to open their lives up and say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Come into my heart. I give my life to you. I recommit my life to you. Maybe some of you have been away for a long time. Recommit your life to him in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen.